Good morning, everyone. Um, we're a bit here a bit earlier in, this, in, the, uh, in the service than we normally are. Uh, I won't take that as a license. Uh, <laughs> I just thought Cheryl's um, comments about the human body and how incredible it is, I've got another one to add, that there are 100 billion stars, probably, more or take, give or, give or less, in the universe, but in our brains, there are 100 trillion neural connections. So there are more, more connections in our brain than there are stars in the universe, which is pretty incredible. So l l last week, um, I talked about the, uh, the pursuit of God and how we uh, are called to pursue God. But, but more importantly, that God pursues us even more diligently, vigorously uh, than we um, pursue him. And the initiative is really with God. And, uh, I, you know, one of the advantages of getting a wee bit older is that you do have the opportunity to change your perspective or see new perspectives on things. So this morning I'm going to talk about something else I've had a new perspective of. Um, but I'll just start with a, a wee bit of background. So um, as some of you know, I work at um, Hora Tapai, which is a wee Maori health provider. And a couple of years ago, we had a young woman doctor who was in her final year who was um, coming to work with us for a few months to see what life was like outside the rarefied air of the hospital. And she would drive up from Wellington every day. And she was a Pākehā girl, a uh, very nice young lady. When she left, she presented Horotapai with a, a, uh, a wee painting. She was a bit of an artist as well. A watercolour of three views of Kapiti Island from different parts of her journey up the coast. Because, as you know, Kapiti Island looks quite different from Pukarua Bay from, from up here. And she said, this is to sort of symbolise the different perspectives I've had on health since coming to work with a Maori health provider, different from the ones in the hospital. And I think the, the, the reason for telling that is because I, as I travel along, I get different perspectives on the heart of God still the same island out there, but you see it from different perspectives. still the same heart of God, but sometimes you get a different perspective. It doesn't mean that the other one was wrong. It just adds to that depth and understanding. So what, what I want to look at this morning is a different perspective. And um, it, it might be a wee bit challenging for some people, but some people will understand this and not be challenged at all. Really, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So none of this is, is, a, is a condemnation. It's a call to go deeper into the heart of God and understand what he, he is really, uh, what's on his heart and how we can walk in, in tune with that. So the idea I came across um, a few months ago now that I've been percolating slowly through was this writer who suggested that in the, in the Western church, um, we have quite a good understanding, although we don't always walk in the fullness of it, we have quite a good understanding of God's heart towards those who are sinners. That's us, all of us who are sinners. We, we might not work, walk in the fullness of that, but we have quite a good understanding of the basic doctrines around salvation, sanctification, justification by faith, those sort of things. And his thought um, was that in the Western church, we don't necessarily have the same focus or depth of understanding on those who are sinned against as opposed to the sinners. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. What does that mean? Who are the sinned against? And the truth is that we live in a fallen world, so we're all sinned against at some time or other in our life. But we also do know that there are groups of people or individuals or places in the world where there is a deeper effect of other people's sin on them. We know about oppression. We know about abuse. We know about poverty. We know all of those sort of things. And his thesis was that we need to develop a deeper understanding of what God's heart is to those people. So that's what I'm going to explore this morning. 
But as I, as I started thinking about that, I thought, what is it like to, to miss, if you like, understand what the heart of God is? And it reminded me of a story that I'd read almost 50 years ago now from a missionary. And so I've paraphrased it, and we'll just start with that. And so this is the story, and, uh, and then we'll pick it up from there. The disciples were tired as they wended their way through the clumps of people still scattered on the hillside. It had been another incredible day with their master. He had spoken eloquently and gently to the crowd. Some of the things were new, some they'd heard before. Some things they understood, and some things they did not understand, but they knew would be explained later. As they walked, they talked about their favorite parts of this incredible day. One of them talked about some high point from the teaching. Another finally understood something they'd never quite understood before. As they talked, a small boy looked into the eyes of one of the disciples with a questioning look, and the disciple felt an emotion he could not quite name, but he hurried to catch up with the other 11 who were just visible in the fading light. As they talked, they agreed, as they talked, they discussed the size of the crowd, and they reckoned there were at least 5,000 people there. They also decided that the high point was indeed the miracle they witnessed at lunch. Remember, said one, how the master prayed for the food. Yes, interrupted another, and all he had was two small fish and two small loaves of bread. Yes, burst in a third, and yet with that small offering, he distributed to all 12 of us, and it was just what we needed. Incredible, said another, that the master could feed 12 grown men with two small fish and two small loaves of bread. Yes, exclaimed another, the 12 of us were all well fed, and there was enough for second helpings for all of us, and there's still a basket of food left over for our lunch tomorrow. Spontaneously, as they walked down through the boats, through the huddled, hungry crowd of 5,000, they broke into a hymn of praise to God. And uh, when I read that 50 years ago, I found that very challenging. And I still do. And it sort of relates to what we're talking about this morning. God has given us these blessings. And we should enjoy them. We should eat fully of them and be satisfied. But they are not just for us. We have to have open hands. So, let's look at God's heart for the sinned against. Now, by the sinned against, we might, in modern use, use the word marginalised. And we might use the word poor. We might use those who are disconnected. We might think of people who are not um, able to care for themselves for whatever reason. And if we start in the Old Testament and move forward, we see clearly that from the very start of Israel, God had a heart for people who were poor and marginalised. There were laws about all sorts of things, even as much as when you gathered the grain in from your fields, you had to leave the, the corners empty so that the poor could come along afterwards and gather something for themselves. Care for the poor and mercy were part of the DNA of Israel. Um, in Micah it says, He has told you, a man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Justice, kindness, mercy, and concern for the poor were absolutely at the core of what Israel was supposed to do. And it's interesting that there was a system of sacrifice set up. There was a way that people by faith could draw close to God and Israel. But unless it was worked out or coupled with this care of, for justice and mercy, um, it didn't mean anything. In Isaiah, he says, The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Um, your spread, you spread out your hands in prayer. I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. So even in that situation where God had appeared to, to uh, Moses and given him the, the commands, and the people had an understanding of what it was like to dwell with God and could go to the temple. 
unless that was coupled with justice and mercy and care for the poor, God wasn't really interested in their prayers. I find that quite challenging. So, and, and it's interesting even to look back on some of the incidents in the Old Testament, um, which we would see differently. So, uh, just choosing one is David and Bathsheba, where David um, had an affair with Bathsheba, who was the wife of an army officer. We might see that in terms of personal morality, but when Nathan the prophet confronted um, David, it was about abuse of power. It was not about morality, although the Bible is very clear that adultery is off the, off the table. Um, but, but David's prime sin was one of abuse of power and neglect of the laws and justice of his society. So does that thread continue through to the New Testament? Well, interestingly... Um, the Magnificat, which is a song that Mary sang when she was uh, told that she was going to have uh, Jesus as her son. The Magnificat, which is found in Luke 1, says, God has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has cast down the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. So even at the very start of, before Jesus' ministry started, there was this idea that Jesus was there to fill the hungry with good things. That was part of the heart of God. When John the Baptist sent word to Jesus saying, um, you know, are you the Messiah? John, Jesus said uh, to the messengers, go and report to John what you've seen. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. It, behold, blessed is everyone who does not stumble on account of me. This is a declaration, you know, and, and we can spiritualize that. But I suspect it wasn't a spiritual thing. Those deaf actually did hear. Those poor were actually um, fed. That, you know, these are physical things that Jesus did that were part of his ministry because he had the heart of God. Jesus lived by example, involved himself with the marginalized and the poor as well. So God, so we're beginning to see an idea that God has a heart for the poor for the marginalised. Now, some of us at various parts in our life have been poor and marginalised and, and may, may still be there or may not be there. But the point is that, that every society, as Jesus said, that the poor will always be with you. Every society has its marginalised groups, its poor groups, and God's heart is for those people. And then we come to the story of the sheep and the goats, uh, which you all know that Jesus divided at, at the end of time, God divides people into sheep and goats. And interestingly, both the sheep and the goats call God Lord. But he says to them, to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to me. And they said, when did this ever happen? And he said, whenever you did it to the least, to, to a stranger, you did it to me. The heart of God is right there. And it's, it's a very, to me, that's a, 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 the same message as was given in the Old Testament. That calling Jesus Lord without understanding the heart of God towards the poor Misses the boat. It misses the boat. Um, and, to the, and to the Pharisees, Jesus was even more direct. He said, uh, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And I think, you know, if we go back to that original way of 
of, of looking at it, he was saying, yes, the, the, the issues around being a sinner are important and, and your relationship with God are important, but there are also matters of justice, mercy and faithfulness that you cannot neglect. James says very explicitly, and James is an interesting book if you want to read about justice and mercy, religion that our God, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And John says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? The love of God must have tangible physical um, evidence. Not evidence because we're not trying to prove anything, but it works its way out through tangible things that we do. So, as I say, sometimes I think I have spiritualized some of that stuff away. Sometimes I've thought that uh, it was out of duty I had to do this stuff. But I'm beginning to see that that is actually the heart of God. He's got a heart of God to seek us, as we talked about last week, and find us and pursue us. But he's also got a heart of God. The heart of God is soft towards those who are in need and marginalized. And as I thought about it, I I thought there are a couple of things. The first is that the the, uh, Victorians had an idea of the deserving poor. Basically, they divided poor people into two groups, deserving and those who had done it to themselves. Nowhere in the Bible do I see that concept. Nowhere. Because basically, a lot of the stuff we brought on ourselves, we have actually brought on ourselves, but God's mercy is still with us. There is no division about deserving and undeserving poor. And whatever our state of need, God's heart is soft, soft towards us. And as I was thinking about it, I, I had this parallel between worship and and being involved in in uh, caring for the marginalised, the poor, and the hungry. You know, we worship every morning, and and thank you to our worship team, which is fantastic. We do it to honour God. We do it because it's the heart of God that we worship. We we do it as a witness to the greatness and the glory of our God. Our 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 worship is not a, a tool of evangelism. Our worship is to honour God. And even if no one was here but the worship team, you could still have a worship session. Even if you're in a room by yourself, you can have a worship session. Likewise, the heart of God for the poor is, is because our involvement with them is not because we're trying to convert people or have an agenda. It's because that is the heart of God. He has said, take care of the poor. And to do so honours God. Whatever their response, however they respond, it honours God. I don't believe, as some people say, this is the social gospel. This is the gospel. The gospel is that God is with the poor. And the challenge and the, and the, and the excitement I feel about pushing into, into the heart of God more is, how do I then push into that? Because there's no condemnation, as I said at the beginning, about what we have or haven't done in the past. But this is an invitation for us to more fully engage the heart of God. And I'm excited to be in a church which is beginning to do that. And and, uh, through the church leadership, all the the fantastic things that are happening here. But, you know, I think that that Cheryl and um, Janine and Shane, who do the Koha Centre and all the others are honouring God as much as our worship team. The, 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 the people who serve the, the, the meal for uh, on, on Sunday night or Saturday night for Mary's are honouring God just as much as our worship team. And we need that sort of ability to honour God amongst the people we live with. Not so that it will do anything more than honour God. Now, of course, people come in and hear the worship and start to hunger and thirst after God. And likewise, when we do things that, that honour God in the community, people will hunger and thirst after God and ask what it's about. But we're not coming with an agenda. So as I look back on my life, I think, well, why have I... Why, 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 why haven't I heard this, understood this before? And, and just offer a few things out of my own personal journey. Um, 
first thing is that we live in a very individual society. And a lot of our spiritual life is, is internal. And we're not very prepared to share it. And so we go on our own particular paths. And we do meet on Sundays, but, but we have our own view of what's right and wrong. And so we, we, we follow that and we don't share that. We're not necessarily that externally focused. We work as individuals. Uh, I mean, I, I could possibly build a house for some homeless person to live in, but I wouldn't recommend that anyone actually lived in it if I'd built it. Uh, I, it's, it's just not my skill set. <laughs> um, if we are to be involved with people who are uh, in real material need, we need every skill set we can muster in the church. Uh, and none of us can do it by ourselves. Some people don't want to get political, and, and I sort of get that, but this is not about expressing our ideologies. It's about finding tangible ways to help people who are in need. And sure, you know, um, if you're blue, green, yellow, red, whatever you are on the political spectrum, you may have different ideas about how to get there, but the objective is the same. No one here believes that that children being abused is a good idea. No one here believes that living under a bridge is a good thing. No one here believes that going hungry is a good thing. No one here believes that not having good shoes to go to school in is a good thing. We all know that. So in a sense, it's political, but in another sense, no, we're just sitting down trying to solve some difficult problems. And of course, we won't achieve perfection. In our own spiritual lives, we don't achieve perfection this side of eternity. When we go to heaven, we will know as we are known. Likewise, we're not going to build a perfect society on earth. That's not what it's about. It's about honouring God through the way we treat the marginalised in our society. And when Jesus returns and the government is on his shoulder, as it says it will be, then we will have a perfect society. So... As I, I, I'm sort of excited by this, but I'm sort of also a wee bit scared by it. <laughs> I've presented this to you not, not to actually condemn, because I don't believe there's any condemnation in it at all. But there is a challenge and an invitation to enter deeper into the heart of God, into the heart of God for uh, the poor in the community. So, so what can we do about it? I, th I think the first thing to recognise is that Start small. We don't actually have to do a lot. Jesus said, even offering a cup of cold water in my name honors me. And so we, we, we don't have to do a lot. We can cook a meal for someone. We can, we can see people for a start. We can see the people begging on the street. We don't even have to give them anything. We can engage them. Because marginalization is not is a lot more than lacking physical things, it's lacking connection as well. We can connect with people. We can learn to work together. And we can figure out what, where we have the skills and where we don't have the skills. But I think it's an exciting call to be drawn deeper into the heart of God. And as we do, it will bless not just those around us, but it will bless us as well, as we have a, a, that closer relationship with God our Father. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the invitation to see more and more of your heart. And we know that as, um, as we go through eternity, we will understand you even more, but there will never get to the end of your greatness and your goodness and your love. We thank you for all the things you've given us. And just help us to honor you in our daily lives, help us to honour you through our prayer and worship, and help us to honour you through the way that we treat those around about us in our community. Give us the eyes to see the people that you love and see and have a soft heart towards, and give us the wisdom to know how to respond to those, both as individuals and as the body of Christ. Amen.